architecture and the built environment and the, the human footprint that we put on the planet largely governs how the ecology and biodiversity and natural systems evolve because they are constantly having to adapt and respond to our human behavior as opposed to us having to do it with respect to their systems. And therefore, it's extremely important to have not just the human as the character for which architecture designs for, but maybe uh, other organisms both micro and macro scales, flora and fauna. But I am aware of one thing and I'm really, I strongly believe in the fact that as architects, we are constantly forced to think on multiple scales and multiple layers. And that's how our drawings evolve from basic plumbing and electrical supplies to super complicated structural details. We take the same framework and then we start detailing those things out. So I imagine that we might actually simply begin by adding two extra drawings that are able to at least start talking about those things. Where are those areas? Where are those uh, services? Where are those systems that are at least beginning to integrate the things that are already existing on the site that we, that we are designing for? I was wondering if you see this concept of functional architecture or biomaterials applied in architecture as a better way to integrate ourselves with the natural world? Right, so I think there are two parts to this where the first um, looks at us evolving our design methodologies to amalgamate the top-down and bottom-up approaches. And that includes us considering biological materials as just one element. The other is evolving our design tools, fabrication tools that will allow us to fabricate on a larger scale with those new biomaterials. And obviously that the, the, the thing that binds it is um, the design. What, how do we design for it? Are we simply replacing the same morphology with a new material? Maybe not. We need to start responding on across different scales and that asks us to consider material properties, new design, fabrication techniques, respond and evolve the morphologies, the types of designs that we make. Obviously for the application, for the biological application that we are designing for. So all of these things are extremely interlinked and it will potentially allow us to think both top down and bottom up simultaneously. Um, and the other thing about bioaesthetics or anything that we design that has an element of life to it will not always be static. It will always respond to not just the environment, but also us as humans. And we are able to sort of respond on the five senses that we resonate with. So it will change, we will see growth and we will see decay. And that will definitely create a level of empathy, I feel, and incorporating that bioaesthetics, not simply designing biomaterials that are immortal, but designing biomaterials that rapidly change with seasons, with sun, with days and nights, and then seeing how the human and the non-human interact with each other. I feel that is a very, very critical aspect. And bioaesthetics will be disgusting. Yeah. Definitely. Because so, it is dirty. Yeah. So um Just in but, but we are, I feel that as humans, we are able to adapt to changing, uh, changing visual perceptions. So we can develop an eye towards the dead and the live, but we need to design for it. In 2013, Arup unveiled a pilot project at the International Building Exhibition, which was the world's first bioreactive facade. Mm -hmm. Have you seen a change in how the industry is kind of accepting of biomaterials and how biomaterials are perceived by architects and those working in the built environment over the last kind of five to ten years? So firstly, I have to say it's amazing you're asking me this question because the BIQ is super, super, super close to my heart. I've been there and I remember crying at the sight of it. <laughs> my research actually evolves and stems with the vision that I want to design BIQ part two or 2.0. Nice. Uh, and that's how I remember from my master's, I started my PhD with the vision of proposing BIQ 2.0. 
I also remember that because this, when I visited, I remember how alive this building was, how facade, the bubbling, the green coloration, the movement of water, uh, the constant buzz noise. I, I sat there the entire day observing the building and I observed the people that always passed by and they were always intrigued that what is going on and there is definitely more going on. And that changes the perception of what a building can or a building should do. And with that sort of my research evolved with the sort of dream that at some point before I grow super old, I can propose a BIQ 2.0. And we looked at how we can reduce the current mechanical, but increase the biological within the system. And right. that's how we started looking at algae laden hydrogels or other biomaterials that could perform the same photobioreactor in the containers, but in this case, we looked at the materiality so, to replace the containers with the materials. So there has been a shift. I have to acknowledge that if you look at the urban design that has evolved around the BIQ, the colors, yeah. have, the, the colors are consciously green. The, the sort of there are more plants and there are more fauna and there's more wooden just because of one building, what has evolved around, even if they can't exist, even if they can't incorporate something that high tech, they have made the effort to at least respond and try to do, you know, whatever their little bit, which I find quite fascinating. So I feel that we are in the sort of initial phase where we're slow and steady progressing further and finding new designs, finding new systems that we can create and we can integrate. And now it's a matter of really testing them uh, in the real field and then changing back. And I feel the project in this, uh, which is sort of a similar system, but it's a wall with the biomaterial that proposes the cleaning of wastewater. So now the idea is to actually you know, use those materials, put them in a building system, put it out in the real world, see what doesn't work, take it back into the lab, and then fix it and then go back. So this conversation, so we are, I feel there. I yeah. am hopeful say in another five years, we should have at least two to three such systems that are responding to say pollution, wastewater treatment, photosynthetic carbon dioxide sequestration, and things would get exciting. If we were at the kind of point in the future that you are hoping for in terms of bio-integrated architecture, like what would you love to see? There's a few key words that I that keep ringing to me, and that is density. Rethinking what density really means in urban spaces, decentralizing those densities, depending on the ecological carrying capacity of a land. I find this fact actually very fascinating. This professor called Duncan Cameron said that the soil in urban cities is in today's time more rich for the growth of plants as opposed to farmlands, because we've maybe depleted that soil, especially the top soil, but we've maybe, because we've constructed buildings here, we've managed to protect that top soil. And I feel that that's quite an opportunity. Yeah. Like we do not need to think that nothing can grow where we live. No, we can actually grow way more where we live. And that's how, you know, you do see systems such as hydroponics, but also microbial farming and these things being more integrated. And I feel as um, schools and libraries are important within an urban design or of an area, uh, the ecological carrying capacity and doing zoning according to that, and then right. um, sort of having uh, microbial farming or these sort of dedicated lands and plots and then rethinking the density, the height, um, like the butterfly house by Michel Joachim is really fascinating. But yeah. even designing for the unpredictable is another thing that I find super fascinating. And you sort of put something out for it to be colonized. We don't know what's going to colonize it, but give an opportunity to life to thrive. What, so my dream would be to not have uh, like the same pigeonholes repeated everywhere. Yeah. Uh, break the monotony, 
de-densify, decentralize? And I think that the answers will start evolving by themselves because nature, you don't need to design biology. It's already there. Agreed. 